throughout the 19th century, the political views of the Protestants in the North changed radically. In the 1790s, Ulster Presbyterians were at the forefront of the nationalist movement, but now they believed that their wealth and security depended on the link with Britain. Most Protestants now identified themselves with Britain and wanted to remain part of the Union. They became known as Unionists. Unionists were mainly Protestant, and most Protestants lived in the North. Nationalists wanted to govern themselves. They wanted home rule. In 1875, a new member of the Home Rule Party arrived in Westminster. Being a rich man, he was a strange choice to take up the cause of the poor. And to high society in Ireland, he became feared as a dangerous man. He was Charles Stuart Parnell. Charles Stuart Parnell was born in 1846 in Avondale. His father was a wealthy landowner and his mother was American. He was elected as MP in 1875. In Parliament, he drew attention to Ireland and disrupted proceedings by getting Irish MPs to give long speeches. This was parliamentary obstruction. He became president of the Land League and leader of the Irish party. He called on the Irish peasants not to pay their rents and was jailed without trial at Kilmainham Jail. In 1889, his affair with Kitty O'Shea split the party and many turned against him. He died in Brighton in 1891. Parnell made it clear that his aim was to get rid of landlords. He wanted to bring about the reduction of rack rents and to facilitate the obtaining of the ownership of the soil by the occupiers. That was also the aim of the Land League, founded by Michael Davitt. Parnell was its president. Both men believed that the land should belong to the people. I believe that the maintenance of the class of landlord in a country is not for the general good of the greatest number. Ireland has suffered more than any country in the world from such a class. How do we induce the landlord to see the position? You must show the landlords that you intend to take a firm grip of your homesteads and your land. The Land League grew stronger and stronger. Farmers were unhappy because importing of cheap food was lowering the price that they could get for their own corn. Support for the Land League spread all over Ireland and into Ulster. The flag of the Land League is unfurled in the very heart of the Protestant North, recruiting loyal men in Down and Antrim. The Land League is with us, yet Ulster is not at peace. In the early days, farmers in the North, both Protestant and Catholic, were as enthusiastic as any. Of course, they loved the idea of owning their own land. In the West, some started attacking landlords and their staff and burning their crops. But Parnell was against violence. He believed he had a better weapon. What are you to do to a tenant who bids for a farm from which another tenant has been evicted? I think I heard someone say, shoot him. I wish to point out a very much better way, a more Christian and charitable way, which offers the lost man the opportunity of repenting. When a man takes over a farm from which another man has been evicted, you must shun him in the street. You must shun him in the shop. You must shun him in the fairground and in the marketplace and even in the place of worship by leading him into a sort of moral coventry by isolating him from the rest of his kind as if he were a leper of old, you must show your detestation of the crime he has committed. Shun the landlord. That deadly policy was first carried out on Captain Boycott in Mayo. Local people refused to work for him because of the high rents, so Protestant workers had to be brought in from Ulster. They were protected by hundreds of police. But local people hounded Captain Boycott, and life became so unbearable that he had to leave. The rents were reduced. The boycott was successful. And so the tactic of putting pressure on someone by ignoring them became known as boycotting. In 1881, Gladstone, the British Prime Minister, introduced a new law. The Land Act, which guaranteed a fair rent for tenants. 
But despite this, the land war was becoming more violent. The government blamed Parnell and threw him in jail. Ireland erupted and Parnell was released, but only after he had promised to support Gladstone's land reforms. Parnell was no more popular than ever, and he was astute. He learned to bargain with the two British political parties. He played the Liberals and the Conservatives off against each other by promising them votes to keep them in power. Gladstone and most of the Liberals were for Home Rule, but the Conservatives did not agree. They campaigned on behalf of the Unionists against the idea of Home Rule. The Home Rule Bill was defeated and the Unionists celebrated. But the celebrations turned nasty as sectarian rioting broke out in Belfast. The Unionists still felt threatened. They feared that the next time Home Rule would be passed. They knew that if a parliament was elected in Dublin, that they would be in the minority. Parnell was the most popular leader that Irish nationalism had ever had. But in 1889, something happened that led to his downfall. For many years, he had been having a secret affair with a married woman called Kitty O'Shea. Everybody found out about it when her husband, another Irish MP, named Parnell in the divorce case. Divorce was not common and was frowned upon by most people. The Catholic bishops demanded that this immoral man should resign as leader. The Home Rule Party split and voted Parnell out of office. Parnell died in 1891, aged 45. 150,000 people marched to Glasnevin for his funeral. The Conservatives came to power in Westminster, and their policy was known as killing home rule with kindness. Gladstone's second home rule bill was defeated, and the Conservatives wanted to make Ireland a peaceful, prosperous place. Their greatest achievement was the 1903 Land Act. Landlords were first persuaded and then forced to sell their land to their tenants. The tenants borrowed money from the government to buy it. It was a total revolution, and after so many years of conflict, it was achieved peacefully. Overnight, Ireland changed from a country of tenant farmers to a country where the farmers owned the land and not the landlords. While politicians campaigned for home rule, other people displayed their nationalism in another way. In 1884, the Gaelic Athletic Association was founded to promote hurling and Gaelic football. The Gaelic League was formed to promote the Gaelic language, history and traditional dance. This Gaelic revival was an assertion of Irishness, to show that the Irish were different from the English. Most nationalists, both Catholic and Protestant, agreed with this and joined these organizations. In the 1910 election, the Liberals and the Conservatives won the same amount of seats. The Liberals needed the support of the Irish Parliamentary Party to stay in power. They made a deal with these nationalists and their leader, John Redmond. They agreed to try to get home rule for Ireland if the Irish party would support them in Parliament. And in 1912, Prime Minister Herbert Asquith introduced the third home rule bill. It seemed that nothing could stop it from becoming the law of the land. Unionists had other ideas. They were determined to stop home rule and they started a campaign against it. They were led by two men who formed a powerful leadership team. One of them was Sir Edward Carson, a Dublin man, a lawyer, and one of the best public speakers in Ireland. The other was a brilliant organiser, Sir James Craig. James Craig was born in County Down in 1871, the son of a millionaire whisky distiller. He was educated in Edinburgh, and Daddy set him up as a stockbroker. His hobby was sailing. He joined the army and fought in the Boer War. When he returned, he was elected as Unionist MP for County Down in 1906. He became second in command to Edward Carson, organising Ulster's resistance to home rule. He was knighted in 1917, and as Sir James Craig, he helped shape the Ireland Act of 1920, which created Northern Ireland. He became Northern Ireland's first Prime Minister in 1921, 
a position he held until his death in 1940. Thousands of Protestants joined Orange Lodges all over Ulster. They swore never to accept the rule of the Roman Catholic Church. Home rule was Rome rule. It was the first step towards an independent Ireland, and in an independent Ireland, the Protestants would be in the minority. We must be prepared the morning home rule passes, ourselves to become responsible for the government of the Protestant province of Ulster. There was no television or radio at this time, so the Unionists and Nationalists used posters, pamphlets, leaflets, postcards and cartoons to spread their message. The Unionists were well organised and held huge protest meetings. The largest was held at Balmoral in Belfast. Then Craig had a brilliant idea. He wanted to show the government how much support the Unionists had. The plan was to get as many people as possible to sign a pledge to the Union. And on the 28th of September 1912, half a million people from all over Ulster signed the Solemn League and Covenant. It swore to defeat Home Rule using all means which may be found necessary, and to show how strongly they felt, some even signed in their own blood. The day became known as Ulster Day, and the Unionists prepared to fight the British government. If they had an army, they would show the government how determined they were to stop Home Rule. They formed the Ulster Volunteer Force, and 100,000 men, both rich and poor, joined up. The only things missing were weapons. That changed in April 1914, when the SS Clyde Valley landed in Larne with a shipment of arms paid for by rich businessmen. That night, the UVF blocked off the town as 25,000 rifles and ammunition were loaded into cars and taken all over Ulster. The UVF could now back up the threats of resistance with force. The matter was serious. I am not for a game of bluff. And unless men are prepared to make great sacrifices, which they clearly understand, the task of resistance is no use. In response, the Nationalists set up an army of their own, the Irish Volunteer Force. In July 1914, just months after the Larne gun running, a large shipment of arms arrived in Hoth on board a yacht called the Asgard. Three people were killed as the guns were taken away, and this angered nationalists. Now, both sides had weapons. The two leaders, Carson and Redmond, met at Buckingham Palace in 1914. There, it was suggested that some of the counties in Ulster should be allowed to stay united with Britain, while the rest of Ireland would be governed by a separate parliament in Dublin. No agreement was reached, and Ireland stood on the brink of terrible bloodshed. Home rule was passed in May 1914, but before it could take effect, in August 1914, World War I broke out in Europe. Unionist and Nationalist leaders decided to stop quarrelling and told their supporters to go and join the British Army. Around 170,000 Irish men marched off together, Unionist and Nationalist, Protestant and Catholic, Orange Man and Hibernian, to fight the Germans in Europe. Bless the good fortune which brings us together, rich men and poor men, short men and tall, some from the seaside and some from the heaven, townsmen and countrymen, Irish men all, Ulster men and Connacht men, Munster men and Leinster men, faithful to Erin, we answer her call. After the war, both Unionists and Nationalists expected to be rewarded with the kind of Ireland that they wanted.
the British nor the nationalists got what they wanted. Instead, it was decided that the only solution was partition, the division of Ireland. Nationalists would have their own government in the south, but remain within the British Empire. Unionists would have their own parliament in the north of Ireland, governing the six counties of Ulster. We began this series in 1798 with the United Irishmen, when Protestants and Catholics fought together for an Irish Republic. And we finish with the division of Ireland in 1921. This partition was meant to be a temporary measure, but since then the two parts of Ireland have drifted even further apart. Today we are still talking about what should be done. Should the North stay part of the UK, or should it join the South as part of an independent Ireland? The people of the North and the governments of Britain and Ireland still can't agree. Protestant Unionist and Catholic Nationalist are still divided. But if you look back at the history of Ireland since the 17th century, you'll see that their differences were never just about religion, but also about political and economic power.